So, in our Bible study, Thursdays at 11 a.m., Thursdays at 11 a.m., in our Bible study lately, we've been diving into the book of John's Revelation, the very last book of our scriptures, the closing book of the Bible, and studying the words that God has for us there. And i got to tell you, so far it has been a wild ride. I don't know if you've ever sat down with the book of John's Revelation, but there's some crazy stuff in there, incredible symbols, a lot of weird images and strange visions, a great ocean as if made of glass before the throne of God, a lion who is inexplicably somehow also a man. There's numbers that have strange significance and beasts and voices from heaven and trumpets and seals and scrolls and seriously, it's been really crazy. And I think it's been interesting to the folks who've been sharing it with us. And I know that it's been interesting for me because this is really my first time sitting down and studying John's Revelation. First time really getting my teeth into this deeply bizarre genre that we in the business like to call apocalyptic literature. Apologies, by the way, to Bible study folks. We're going to be covering some ground again that we have already covered in the Bible study. Apocalypse comes from a word, and I'm going to, I'm going to throw this open game show style. Apocalypse comes from a word. Who thinks it's Latin? Who thinks it's Greek? These are your choices, and I now need hands. Okay, let's see. Some, some of my Bible study folks are making are making these. I'm gonna. You guys have to have to make a bet here. Who thinks it's Latin? Anybody? Who thinks it's Greek? Yeah. Here's your pro tip. Words that have a Y in them are probably Greek words. Latin doesn't have the letter Y by and large, and so if it's got a Y in it, it's probably a Greek word. And it means it's a Greek word that, that means to come from or out of. Something or someone hidden or secret. It comes from a root that gives us calypso music. I was listening to calypso music this morning as I was getting ready for my apocalyptic sermon. This is something that is revealed. That's why we talk about John's revelation. A truth or a secret or a wonder. Something hidden from which the veil is pulled back. A revelation. I have... A lot more that I could say to you today about John's revelation. I could teach a whole Bible study on the subject. Oh, wait, I am. Thursdays, 11 a.m., Bible study. Today is fascinating for me because in our lectionary texts, we have two non-revelation apocalypses. So this is my first big teaching for you today, something that you may not have known. There are more apocalyptic stories in the Bible than just the one in John's revelation. In fact... They're all over the place. My Revelation commentator, I'm, I'm reading a commentary on Revelations to get ready for the Bible study. My Revelation commentator, a man named Eugene Boring. Thank you. <laughs> you guys got to laugh at me for a second about that. Dude's name is Boring. Anyway, he says that the work of Jesus, the things that Jesus says and does, cannot be interpreted successfully without understanding the apocalyptic tradition in which he stands, the texts that he is reading and referencing. The scrolls of the prophets Ezekiel, Isaiah, and Jeremiah all contain apocalypses, hidden truths revealed. They use signs and symbols to talk about current events and about heavenly visions. I need to say that again because I have to underline this about 15 times. Apocalyptic, apocalyptic literature uses signs and symbols to talk about the current events of the writer and about heavenly visions. Daniel is probably the most famous apocalypse aside from John's revelation. It's this incredibly action-packed, crazy apocalypse. His kind of writing is scattered throughout the prophets and through Jesus' teaching. We read it in what is called the Isaiah Apocalypse in Isaiah 65, the one I read to the kids. And i got to say, I think this might be my very favorite passage in Isaiah. And I like Isaiah a lot across the board. But this passage from Isaiah 65, this is a practical and charming and lovely dream of peace. 
peace. Peace. Lions and lambs. Creatures who are enemies. Wolves lying down together. The lion eating straw like an ox. And people. People eating what they plant and living in the buildings where they build. None of this business where one person is exploited to build a house and then doesn't have a house for himself. Someone plants all the crops they possibly can, breaks their back in labor to feed you and me, doesn't even get a chance to eat the gleanings. story of people living where they build long lives and blessings. And on that day, no one will hurt or destroy on all God's holy mountain. What a hope. What a peace there is. And I say, if all the apocalypses were like this, if this was the end of the world that was declared by everyone, I say, come Lord Jesus, quickly come. But Jesus, Jesus has a different story. Jesus looks around at his context. He knows the difficulties and the hardships to come. He sees with his eyes the political trajectory and the spiritual trajectory of Israel at the time, and he does not sugarcoat it for his disciples. He says, this is going to be awful. There will be wars, insurrections, Bloodshed, great earthquakes, famines and plagues, and the temple, this wondrous temple, the very peak of Israelite engineering and passion for worship, this temple will be crushed so that not one stone is left on another. He could, by the way, be talking about the temple in Jerusalem. He could also be talking about himself. Could go either way. And he says, some of you will be put to death, and all of you will be hated by hated by all people because of me. You go before judges and magistrates for my name, but not a hair on your head will come to harm. For by your endurance you will gain your souls. I've spent a little time now in the apocalyptic tradition for this particular Bible study and then a very, very brief survey in seminary for my own studies. I've dug into it. And if I've learned anything, it's that the whole genre is tough to read. Here we have two competing apocalypses. One, a prophetic vision of an ideal future, not so far off. And, a litany, uh, and then the other, a litany of difficulties that will precede it. So how do we do this? How do we live into apocalypse? How do we see the things that God has drawn back the veil from, the future and the present and the past? The things that God has revealed to us how do we live into uncertainty and confusion and fear and hope and peace all at the same time? I have a caution for you, as always when I talk about apocalyptic literature. This is the disclaimer that I gave at the beginning of the Bible study, and this is the disclaimer I give to you. If you're going to read Daniel, if you're going to read John's Revelation, if you're going to read these words of Jesus, be warned, there are no easy answers. This is tough stuff. Don't fall into the error of thinking that it is crystal clear. This is visions and dreams and wonders and mysteries written millennia ago for people whose context was so radically different from our own that we must study it to come to understand anything about it. People for whom, forget the iPad, for whom the telephone, for whom the printed word 
were unimaginable. So far in the distant future, they could not see it. For us to claim that John's visions are applicable to us is as ridiculous for us to say that we could take an iPad back to the days of Jesus and have it be useful. They don't have a context for it. We don't have a context for their lives. We have to study. John's revelation, Jesus' remarks, Isaiah's vision of the future, this is not a road map. This is symbol and metaphor and idea and vision. This is not a calendar of events. Many have tried that latter interpretation. Many, most, have been wrong. You all remember Harold Camping from a couple years ago? The big billboards that were driving around saying, 2011, May 21st, 2011, 6 p.m., end of the world is coming. That wasn't the first time that had happened. I'm imagining that those of you who have been around longer than I have, that's the big one that I remember. That's been happening for decades. Prophets have arisen saying, I am he, and the time is near, and they've all been wrong. God's kingdom still hasn't arrived on earth. We are not into the tribulation. So what then? If these works aren't clear instructions for us on how to deal with the end times, what do we do with it? As always, the answers are right in front of us. Right here in our scriptures. For those who have eyes to hear and e eyes to hear, ears to hear and eyes to see. First of all, as Christians in the face of all things, the present times, the future times, the past times, the end times, at all times, we will endure. We will suffer. And we will be faithful. The Christian walk is not, and will not ever be, easy. I've got to admit, it's easier in this country at this time, right now, than in, say, Indonesia, or China, or Iraq. Some of the oldest Christian communities in the world, in Iraq and Iran, have been devastated by the wars and the political instability there. We are in danger of losing some of the oldest Christian traditions on earth, the wars and rumors of wars. Compared to that, it's kind of a cakewalk here, but it's getting harder. With the rise of commercialism and moral relativism and false prophets in our own midst, it's getting harder to be a Christian. And it'll keep getting harder. But for the name of Christ and for the promises that Christ has made to us, we shall endure. We shall suffer even unto death, even in this present age, this present world. End times, not end times, we will still endure. We will keep the faith. And we will hope. We will hope for the visions of Isaiah 65 and of Revelation 22. We shall rest our hope on God's enduring and marvelous peace. Dreams of a city in which there is no war, a city that needs no walls, for there are no enemies seeking to defeat it. That's our birthright. In our co-heirship with Christ, we have been given the wondrous gift of the promise of peace that will last forever. We will endure and we will hope and we will be ready. Because the reality, my brothers and sisters, is that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming back. It's totally happening. And I myself, I am profoundly disinterested in how. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. And I really don't care when. It could be tomorrow, it could be next week, it could not be in my lifetime. Doesn't fuss me. Doesn't make a difference to my walk. What concerns me, the thing that I care about, is the that. Yes, that fact. Jesus is coming. 
And what concerns me is us as the church. Are we ready? Are we ready Wednesday at 9 p.m. as we are ready Sunday at noon? Are we ready for the coming Jesus? Are we ready for the Jesus who called us to feed the hungry, to heal the sick and the injured, to support the brokenhearted, to visit the imprisoned, to clothe the naked? That guy's coming back. Are we ready? The one who yielded up his life for the lives of us all to free us from our sin, the great giver and lover of us for of us all, that guy is coming back. He's coming. Let's be ready. Amen.